Actually, I, th I realize I should probably should have put a question mark at the end of my title since this belongs to that somewhat annoying genre of paper that consists mostly of a tissue of rhetorical questions. Uh, but as uh, Votan tells Mima, uh, asking the right question is, is a useful thing as well. So we'll hope that this is, has some of the right questions for us. Um, in the late 1990s, the influential environmentalist critic Lawrence Buell sought to define what he called a toxic discourse informing texts from the early industrial revolution up to the present day that uh, aim to portray the effects of modern ecological crisis. Key elements of this toxic discourse include, in Buell's terms, uh, a mythography of betrayed Edens, images of a world without refuge from toxic penetration, the threat of hegemonic oppression from powerful corporations or governments, and a Gothicization of urban squalor surveyed through guided tours of the industrial underworld on the model of Dante's Inferno. Anyone familiar with trends in the staging of Wagner's Ring Cycle over the past four decades, and I assume that includes many of us here at this conference, will immediately recognize the centrality of this toxic discourse to modern interpretations. Nibelheim, under Alberich's dominion, is of course the principal locus of such toxicity. Um, and Chirot's celebrated um, Bayreuth Centennial production is of course an essential starting point in any of this, being the first production to stage uh, George Bernard Shaw's now seemingly unexceptionable insight that Alberich's Nibelheim is the direct analog of uh, a mid-19th century coal mine, mill, or factory. Uh, that's obviously not... Um, uh, Chiro, but uh, Francesca Zambella, which we'll hear about later, um, just to show that the, the coal mine um, analog uh, does live on in its sort of original form. Um, since uh, Chiro's time, Nibelheim has more often taken on the aspect of an underground laboratory or research facility. The Tarnhelm and the Ring uh, become products of some modern mad science chemical or nuclear in nature. The Nibelungs have been harnessed to the production of a nuclear arsenal or some other weapons of mass destruction. Uh, I won't stop to comment on these. These are obviously familiar images to many of you, but just examples of uh, toxic discourse in these modern, uh, in many modern productions. Uh, Albert, it's sort of dark, I don't know. Well, anyway, I won't try to lighten it now. Um, the Copenhagen Ring, um, the, the unexplained ominous lesion on Albrecht's face. Um, for Adele Spouse, uh, the Keith Warner we talked about briefly yesterday. Uh, the, again, the, the ominous um, kind of medical laboratory uh, facility. Um, Another important catalyst uh, for all this was, of course, Chirot's opening scene uh, of Das Rheingold here. Instead of representing the depths of the Rhine as the primal, undisturbed environment of the Rheingold in its emblematic natural state, um, Chirot depicted here this ominous industrial apparatus that was part hydroelectric dam and part nuclear reactor wreathed in clouds of steam, which, as Gundula Kreutzer has pointed out, joined Wagner's own technology of phantasmagoric stage illusion with the dominant emblem of the Industrial Revolution, steam power. Uh, later, in uh, Harry Kupfer's Bayreuth cycle, starting in the late 1980s, uh, Kupfer portrayed the toxic effects of the ring as consistently present throughout the cycle. This toxic imagery uh, Kupfer's had a model in some details of Joachim Herz's 1970s Leipzig ring and has obviously continued to influence many subsequent productions. Uh, a lot of this we heard actually in Simon Williams' talk uh, yesterday, prefacing his discussion of Rousseau and nature. Um, at least up to, um, say, Fran Francesca Zambello's production and uh, Keith Warner, which have come up a few times already. Uh, both Kupfer and Goetz Friedrich, in his long-running Berlin production, frame their interpretations in post-apocalyptic terms. The consequences, no less than the origins of the Götterdämmerung, are meant to be ever-present in the mind of the audience. This is most obviously the case with Goetz Friedrich's ring. Friedrich presents the whole action as a ritual reenactment of the god's downfall, already a fait accompli, uh, within the confines, reenacted within the confines of a kind of subterranean fallout shelter his famous time tunnel. Uh, 
a ritual doomed to be repeated ad infinitum in hopes of achieving some adequate understanding of the ring's story. Although put that way, it sounds maybe more like an allegory for the Bayreuth Festival than global apocalypse. <laughs> um, Harry Kupfer prefaces his cycle. Uh, no, more Friedrich. Um, Kupfer prefaces his cycle with a, uh, a post-apocalyptic moment of silence as a gaggle of dazed, speechless gods gather around a smoking crater that will remain center stage throughout. All the nature imagery in Kupfer's cycle is colored either explicitly or potentially by the effects of environmental degradation. Kupfer's Rhine flows through a variant of Friedrich's time tunnel uh, as if part of a vast industrial sewage system its lurid electric green suggesting at once primal ooze and toxic slime. The more ex explicit still are the transformations of the nature settings in Siegfried. Mima's forest hut is toxic waste dump and the primeval forest near Fafner's cave as an exploded nuclear power plant. Uh, sorry, that, oh, that's, well, that's definitely post-apocalyptic, it's just black. <laughs> um, uh, 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 anyway, there, that, that looks like a, a preview of the apocalypse. That's, you know, you probably recognize that's um, uh, act two of, of Siegfried. Um, whether viewing the ring as a single apocalyptic trajectory or a repeating cycle of environmental degradation, these productions share some basic assumptions about its allegorical foundations. Albrecht's theft of the Rheingold and his forging of the ring are, of course, presented unequivocally by Wagner as an allegory of the subjugation of love to wealth and power in modern civilization, or perhaps any civilization. The theft of the gold is clearly represented as the disturbance of an original natural order, an act whose character of original sin is underscored by the ritual renunciation of love required to make use of the gold. The natural, if magically endowed, substance of the gold is turned into an object of artifice, the ring, which generates wealth through the enslavement of a subject population. The darkness, afterwards lamented by the Rhine maidens, represents at once the moral effects of Albrecht's fall and the concomitant despoliation of nature. Uh, these all themes that have been illuminatingly discussed by Mark Berry in the third chapter of his book on politics and religion in the ring. Uh, Wagner's myth of the fall is indeed distinctly modern in relating moral corruption to man's alienation from nature, specifically in the act of exploiting it for the purposes of wealth and power. I'll turn this off, I don't need this anymore. Um, in the age of nuclear weapons and global warming, it's also easy to hear the gesture of apocalypse that concludes the ring cycle as resonating with potential forms of environmental catastrophe. In fact, it's almost difficult not to do so. Um, Alex Rading, in a recent contribution to a panel on ecomusicology and jams, uh, calls apocalypse the master metaphor of the environmental imagination today. But to what extent does Wagner's Ring of the Nibelung actually support the logic of such cautionary environmental parables? That's the question that I want to at least open here today. Does the text of the cycle do its musical language and structure contribute uh, to an environmental message in, in any way, in a modern sense? Are the representations of nature in the ring, whether grounded in ancient myth, medieval poetry, or romantic philosophy and musical practice, compatible with the agendas of modern environmentalism and eco-criticism? How green is Wagner, ultimately? Uh, we might begin, excuse me, uh, we might begin by interrogating the ring itself, the ring not in italics, rather the talisman forged secretly by Albrecht sometime between the first and third scenes of Das Rheingold. As we know, the ring originates from a symbolic act of aggression against the natural order, as I've suggested. Uh, in Götterdämmerung, although I don't believe before that, we hear that the return of the ring to its natural state uh, could avert the imp impending doom of the gods. What exactly the ring does, as opposed to what it symbolizes, is never entirely clear. It secures Albrecht's dominion over the Nibelungs, but demonstration of its instrumental value ends there. Siegfried and Brunhilde remain blissfully ignorant of its powers. Siegfried's parents have never heard of it, nor has the rest of humanity, aside from Albrecht's son Hagen. Uh, 
Since Wagner himself was famously unsure about what really happens at the end of the cycle, it's necessarily difficult to say what exactly the ring might have to do with that. Is the doom of the gods in Wagner's modern mythic vision brought about in any way by the mismanagement of natural resources? Well, yes, if we include gold, but that's really a different matter, one of currency and exchange value rather than the science of mineral extraction. And finally, does the restoration of the ring uh, to its original form and habitation in the Rheingold ever actually promise the renewal of a pastoral golden age, whether for gods or men, or for that matter, for dwarves? I was reminded here of actually Celia Applegate citing uh, a line from Louisa Buchner, I think it was, who, who referred to Wagner as a kind of past Arcadia, the experience of Wagner in Arcadia, from which she had been exiled by losing, losing faith in, in him. Um, the difficulty of answering any of these nagging questions has much to do with the fact that uh, Wagner's allegory of the ring and the Rheingold was largely an afterthought to the story of Siegfried's death and following that, his youth, which uh, Shaw realized much to his aggravation. The original Nibelung sketch of 1848 uh, did include the seeds of this allegory. Um, in, in the sketch, uh, we read, quote, Alberich gained possession of the pure noble Rheingold. He abducted it from the depths of the river and forged from it with great cunning and art, a ring which granted him complete mastery over his race, the Nibelungs. Alberich, we're told further, this is the 1848 sketch, uh, forces the Nibelungs to amass a treasure hoard for him and instructs Mima to, uh, to forge the Tarnhelm. The condition of forswearing love and the more developed symbolism of the gold's natural state under the stewardship of the Rhine maidens, as later in Das Rheingold, are not yet mentioned at all. Only when Wagner in this sketch uh, reaches the material that will become Act Three of Siegfried's Tote, later Goethe Demerung, does the sketch mention, quote, three prophesying daughters of the deep from whom Alberich once stole the gold in order to forge the powerful, fateful ring. Now Wagner adds, uh, the curse and the power of this ring would be destroyed if it were returned to the water and thereby resolved into its original pure element, unquote. Uh, all of this uh, is also developed in Siegfried's death, the standalone original version of Goethe Demerung, uh, where Alberich has also cursed the ring when forced to yield it to the gods. Uh, it will, in, in this first version, Siegfried's tote, the ring will bring death to anyone else who possesses it, although it has no special power beyond granting sovereignty over the Nibelungs, Alberich included. The Rhine maidens plead for its restoration, but the only impending threat is that of Siegfried's death from the curse on the ring, not the end of the gods. The libretto for Siegfried's death concludes with a limited or what we might call a controlled apocalypse of ordinary grand opera proportions, fire and flood on stage, but no global or um, heavenly repercussions. Brunhilde, as you probably remember, in Siegfried's Tote, she accompanies the spirit of the slain Siegfried up to Valhalla, where peace and order will be restored. So, to what extent did Wagner, in expanding and composing the whole cycle, develop implications of the ring's power as deriving from an, uh, an assault on the natural order and from the reckless exploitation of natural as well as human resources? Both the limited apocalypse of Siegfried's death and the expanded version of Goethe Demerung, especially, I think, in its musical setting, uh, involve a promise of renewal, one that can be traced back to the origins of the twilight of the gods trope in the Norse Ragnarok, recounted in the Voluspa, or the Seeress's prophecy uh, from the poetic Edda. As with other related mythic tropes, uh, especially that of the flood, the promise of renewal is contingent on the clen is actually contingent on the cleansing, purging effect of some divine apocalypse, not on averting natural or environmental catastrophe. The same applies uh, to the utopian anarchist vision of Wagner's own time. The promise of renewal for the anarchists depends on the outright destruction of the d existing order. This anarchist vision targets, of course, the social political order and its institutions, although it's unclear whether the natural environment is to be sacrificed as collateral damage. There's not much question that Wagner's politics were more anarchist than environmentalist at the time uh, he conceived the ring cycle. George Bernard Shaw, who was, of course, highly attuned to the anarchist dimension of the ring's ideological genesis, 
solve the whole project in terms of an unresolved tension between a potentially cogent allegory of modern socio-economic and political themes on one hand, um, and the detritus of grand opera, grand operatic aesthetics on the other, which Wagner had renounced in theory, but was still trying to rehabilitate in practice. Shaw did read Siegfried, the, the character Siegfried, as a coherent allegory of anarchism, or what he called neo-Protestantism, committed to overturning the old order, if lacking any policy for the new one. But Siegfried's anarchism, Shaw ruled, has no more useful lesson for modern society than Brunhilde's love panacea promulgated throughout all versions of the text. Thus, Shaw also rejected the promise introduced late in the day by Valtrauta that the gods and the world could be redeemed from the curse on the ring if it were restored to the Rhine maidens. This, considered as part of the previous allegory, is nonsense, he states flatly. Shaw means that it has nothing to do with the Marxist allegory of old feudalism, contemporary capitalism, and the promise of socialism that he had discovered in the first, although later scripted, portions of the ring. As the basis of an environmental parable, however, the motif of the ring's restoration to a natural state is perfectly legible. The power structures controlling the destinies of old gods, new men, and those indeterminate others, the Nibelungs, are all compromised by the curse on the ring, this loveless and reckless exploitation of nature and of uncorrupted human nature embodied in the Volsung clan. The symbolic rejection of this curse, the purification of the ring, and the restoration of a prelapsarian natural order as the starting point for some future society are in fact all plausible goals within this other allegorical logic, the environmental one, rather than Shaw's socio-political one. How much the rest of the ring cycle in between its beginning and its ending might also engage the, alleg the environmental allegory remains a question. The abundance of symbolic and allegorical cues that Wagner embedded in his text, not to mention his ever fluid, the ever-fluid semiotics of his music, continues to fuel staged interpretations at an exponentially increasing rate. In this sense, the ring cycle itself is a renewable resource, and <laughs> the notion of myth as culturally renewable resource was obviously one of Wagner's core beliefs. I do think, finally, that among the abundance of interpretive cues in the ring, we can at least find some seeds uh, of a legitimately, and I didn't mean that to be an uh, eco uh, metaphor, but it is. Um, <laughs> we can find some seeds, uh, I think of Zambello's uh, finale, um, uh, saplings of a legit legitimately environmental reading, uh, regardless of authorial intentions. I think this is my main point, really. Um, it could also be worthwhile, however, to investigate uh, yeah, it could also be worthwhile, however, to investigate the historical status of an emerging environmental consciousness in relation to Wagner's own conceptual horizons over the extended span of the Ring's inception, realization, and early reception. Wagner, the later apostle of vegetarianism and regeneration, however problematic that discourse, was adopted by utopian reformists of all stripes across the fin de siècle. His appeal, uh, to the first generations of explicitly environmentalist thinkers, or possible appeal, uh, the appeal not just of his ideas, but also of the music, may be a small patch of still virgin terrain in the landscape of Wagner research. Um, and in suggesting this, uh, it may be that I'm overlooking work that's already been done, but I'm thinking more generally about points made by Alex Ross and by Celia Applegate today to um, think back 100 years uh, before the Nazi problem and, and, and remind ourselves the real breadth um, of Wagner's appeal across the political spectrum simultaneously to the, the right and the left, and that the right and left positions were not nearly so clearly marked as we think in the post-Nazi uh, post era. Um, so at this point, I'm just going to plead work in progress and wrap up very quickly, uh, just to sum up. Uh, um, my thoughts about this eco-parable potential. Just as Shaw failed to find a coherent allegorical critique of modern capitalism in the cycle, merely the roots of one, the same would apply to reading the ring as an environmental parable, I think. Uh, this is hardly surprising since an awareness of impending environmental crisis in the developed world was obviously much further from Wagner's mindset around 1850 than notions of socialist political reform, whether coherent or simply utopian. 
The gesture of apocalypse at the end of the cycle, however multivalent, is primarily a ritual of cleansing and renewal, to which was later added the symbolic demise of an old order, the conflagration of Valhalla. It would be difficult to argue that Wagner depicts in nature, it would be difficult to argue that Wagner depicts nature in terms of a biological ecosystem that's threatened by the behavior of gods, men, or dwarves. What critic Greg Garrard says of nature's status in the work of Wordsworth and the British Romantics, despite their importance in the genesis of modern eco-criticism, could also be said of Wagner. Uh, a quote from Greg Garrard, substituting Wagner's name here for Wordsworth. The nature that Wagner valorizes is not the nature that contemporary environmentalists seek to protect. Romantic nature is never seriously endangered and may in its normal, normal state be poor in biological diversity. Rather, it's loved for its fastness, beauty, and endurance. By focusing attention on sublime landscapes, mostly mountainous, Wagnerian romanticism, uh, may have diverted atten it attention from places that are more important and under more severe pressure ecologically, though less picturesque, bogs, marshes, and other wetlands. Yet there might still be a case to include Wagner among figures from Wordsworth to Emerson, Thoreau, or even John Muir as an influence on modern environmental consciousness, especially as regards the contribution of artistic representation. The rhetoric of nature in Wagner's prose writings may or may not be, uh, play a role here. More productive, I think, would be a closer interrogation of key figures of nature uh, in the Ring Cycle and also in Parsifal from an eco-critical perspective. Again, Mark Berry's uh, 2006 book offers a lot of uh, useful starting points. These figures of nature begin, of course, at the beginning with the Rhine, the Rhine maidens and their gold, but they persist throughout the cycle. Erda, for instance, why did Wagner refashion the obscure Sibylline wise woman of the Eddas in terms of an earth goddess otherwise missing from his sources? What exactly does Erda want from Wotan when they first meet, or he from her later on in Siegfried? What meanings does Wagner invest in the world ash tree, whose mythic prototype Yggdrasil already suggested the emblem of an ecosystem under constant distress from the populations it sustains? What about the ordinary ash tree that supports Hunding's dwelling, itself the first sign of human culture that we encounter in the ring? What can we see of Nibelheim before as opposed to after Alberich's fall? How clear-cut is the apparent dichotomy of nature versus culture in the case of Siegfried as he progresses from Mima's forest smithy to the Hall of the Gibbikungs? What can we learn from attending with, attending with Siegfried to the voices of nature, whether woodbirds or dragons? These questions, of course, have all been posed often enough before, but without necessarily taking into consideration Wagner's discursive construction of nature or viewing the Gesamtkunstwerk uh, as an ecosystem of mythic, linguistic, and musical signs. Reading Wagner's music dramas through the figure of an ecosystem, beyond a mere catalog of their abundant nature effects or analytical deployment of, deployment of the organicist trope, could direct our attention beyond, say, the timbral signification of horns and woodwinds or the role of perfect fourths, fifths, and major triads as building blocks of the leitmotivic network toward a more dynamic conception of nature, metaphorically applied to, say, motive, tonality, language, timbre, voice, and much more. Even if we don't imagine that the ring cycle was really intended as a call to save the planet from ecological catastrophe, reading its mythical musical landscape through terms derived from, the real, from real biological landscapes could prove a productive strategy for relating many of Wagner's concerns to some of our own, not just as scholars, critics, and listeners, but also as human beings. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tom, for a wonderful paper um, on like a very important topic. Um, is there anything you want to ask Tom? Please. There. Uh, Bill? Or? Over there, on the very left from my side. Just to ask about something you mentioned glancingly at the end of your uh, excellent remarks, that the um, uh, not just the Rhine maidens, but the Norns, of course, are concerned about environmental problems and the demise of the ash tree that they relate, and it's related spring, uh, 
yeah. uh, is connected to another symbol of power, isn't it? Uh, a Wotan spear, which then is eventually going to be shattered by Siegfried. So would you see that as a parallel construction to the um, ring being forged from the material, natural material in the depths There's of the Rhine and, and yeah. Wotan's spear also being, yeah. the uh, origin having environmental of, yeah. Um, impact? Yeah, clearly the origin of the spear from the um, world ash tree has lots of potential in that direction, um, although when it becomes um, uh, a sign of uh, you know, treaties and, and government uh, with the runes and all. I think that's obviously heading in a different direction. Um, but um, yeah, altogether, the, I, the Norns and the prologue to Gotter in, in his final version open up a lot of possibilities. Also, I, thought, I think maybe the, the thread, you know, the, the, the Norns thread snapping under this increasing pressure could easily be turned, um, uh, maybe productions do this, but you could turn that into a kind of environmental, the, the pressure on, on the environment could be somehow applied uh, to, to that image as well, I think. But the Norns, well, because Norns really fit in, I was just listening very briefly, these sort of familiar figures. Uh, so the Norns, you know, do come in under Erda, but then have their own, uh, especially in the, well, obviously in their one scene in the, in the um, Gotter Demrung prologue, um, open up more potential. Um, and they often do, you know, in, in these various sort of to toxic or sort of r rubbishy readings like, like Zambello, uh, the Norns are often um, portrayed like the Rhine Maidens as victims of the despoliation of the ruin of nature. Christian? Um, uh, the ash tree, uh, you, you referred to Kupfer's Bayreuth um, production. Uh, in the Berlin production, he developed this idea, and the, through our our DVD uh, memory, uh, rising mm. memory, it's also um, uh, graspable or available through the Bas Barcelona production. So from Kupfer, we got we have two. We have two that, on yeah, video. I and know. Is the so the Berlin and Barcelona are the same? Essentially the same yes, revival. Yes, they are. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there he he. Um, <laughs> takes the Bayreuth idea, uh, or the, the ash tree becomes a leitmotif for the whole uh, production, mm -hmm. and it starts with Wotan um, a, as a prologue, uh, breaking uh, th uh, the, the branch out mm -hmm. of the ash tree. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it makes this story um, the, the main story for uh, the whole uh, four evenings. Yeah. And the, 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 the moment I was talking about in, mm. uh, in the Wotan monologue mm. is in this, he had to come up with a new idea you know, for mm. his uh, own production. And in this moment, and it's on the, on the DVD, it's a little um, funny because in this moment, a huge branch of the ash uh, tree mm. falls down mm. uh, and and destroys the, the stage floor. Uh -huh. uh, so the idea that the, the, uh, the nature is, is, is suffering. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, portraying the, the actual demise of the ash tree would be, I didn't realize, I, I've seen some of the Barcelona version of Kupfer, but I don't remember that. Um, but yeah, in fact, going, going back to Bill's question, I should, should have said, yeah, more specifically, that would be the issue. The fact that the, we were told that the ash tree is dying because of Wotan's act of violence against it sort of mirrors Albrecht's um, act of uh, aggression against the Rheingold. But even, well, less than that, is it really worked into the rest of the ring as far as the text, it seems to me. I mean, we hear in Goethe um, when Waltraut is, um, comes and, and narrates the impending doom, we hear about it, but it's not it's not as clearly um, represented as a cause for the end, although it's, it's kind of an add-on, it seems to me. So, but like so many things, it's, it's open for productions to kind of develop it. And um, yeah, I think altogether, uh, you know, there would be many more ways in which the ash tree could be made more u ubiquitous. And I mentioned the sources for the ash tree, the Yggdras Hill, which is you know, quite interesting in the Eddas where it's been constantly nibbled away at by oh, some deer down here and squirrels up here. There's like, like an evil squirrel that runs around up and down and <laughs> nibbles on it. Um, so the whole, you know, as it, it, it very much, you know, the Yggdras Hill is the kind of the it's, it is the world ash tree. I mean, it supports the whole world. It's the framework for the world, but it's constantly under, under um, duress from creatures that are eating at it. Um, so, so there's there is a lot to work with with the in the ash tree. I think we have to kind of 
stop here with questions because we are running late. So thank you very much, uh, Tom, again okay. for this wonderful talk. Okay.